to love December. Somewhere under all these worn and worried times known as grown up living, dwells the child who loved December, who didn't see the bustle as a burden, didn't push around a mound of musts, a shopping cart of shoulds, whose delight at the fragrant pine dad brought in from our woods glowed as bright as the bubble lights and tinsel strands we'd hang. While mama made the fruit cakes from our grandma's recipes and Bill and I sponged stencil shapes of stars, candy canes and trees upon the window panes and wired green boughs of cedar to white fence posts tied up with red. Whose quick belief that magic found in the far off north could sweep through night to our southern home with its load of wishes granted. Whose simple faith that the carols we sang in church were true, that goodwill to all and peace on earth could be, whose sweet conviction then as now, that the love that weaves among us all binds tighter in this season. These reasons for that child and for me are enough to love December. My name is Lorraine Thompson, and this piece is called Sweater Weather. Four oversized fleece hoodies, a couple of earth tone cable knits, two fancy ones with bad girl zippers at the neck and at the wrist, a burgundy, uh, two browns, at least four blacks, because I feel sexy in black. Cowl necks. I mean, who doesn't love a good cowl neck? I mean, it's the general look of a turtleneck without the choking. <laughs> it's a no-brainer. And shawls. There are over-the-shoulder shawls, and they're over-the-head shawls. These are the family's secret keepers. There's the cardigan, the sweatshirt, the jumper, the shrug. They are all the spiced chai of clothing. They are the first moment between clean flannel sheets. They are the comforting tick of the clock that hung in my grandmama's kitchen when she lived in the trailer. They are the love child of Jack Frost and a very hearty Irish lass. And they are the security blanket that keeps me both safe and warm during winter. My name is Michelle Castleberry and my poem is called Winter Garden 2020, dedicated to any quarantine gardeners from this past year. I dig the sweet potatoes before the first freeze, pull beans and peas from the chilling dirt. Cold air sweetens the turnip and collard leaves. I dip like an oil rig until my back starts to hurt, then straighten to take in the lay of the land. So many times this year I failed my garden planted too soon, fed with too heavy a hand, installed seedlings without first letting them harden. Blight took the hollyhocks, bugs ate the kale. I fought wind and drought and burn and wilt. The gourds were my glory, draping the fence like a veil with six future birdhouses that the gourd vine built. No matter what calamity from this or any year, I know in the next Zinnias and tomatoes will volunteer. Thanks. I'm Juliana Gray, and I'm going to read a poem called The Skaters that was originally published in the Cincinnati Review. The Skaters. What a thing to trust your life to, a scenic veneer of solid safety slashed with blades. Give me four cubes in a gin and tonic. Give me salt for sidewalks and lacquered roads. In London, 1867, the ice gave way in Regent's Park and hundreds fell into the faithless lake. In a trice, Victorian coats and heavy skirts swelled with water. Boots and skates pulled them down. They clawed at branches, each other, the frozen shelf, mad to regain the land. Forty drowned. So cold it was, 
The ice resealed itself and kept them for days, preserved like florist wares under glass, reaching toward the air. Tis the night before Christmas. I whisper the rhyme and wander in fancy to once on a time. I see the big fireplace, the girls and the boys, the long heaped up stockings, the drums and the toys. Tis the night before Christmas, so old and so new, with all of its dreamings so good and so true. I see all the faces forgotten so long, and out of the twilight there murmurs a song. Tis the night before Christmas, and here by my grate, the past rises glowing, the years lose their weight. The boy days come trooping and memories call, and gleam in the embers that flicker and fall. Tis the night before Christmas, ah, could I but clutch the gold of my fancies, t'would go at my touch. The shouts and the laughter, now sweet to my ear, would shrink to a silence too deep and too drear. Tis the night before Christmas, remembrances stir, as sweet as the cherished frankincense and myrrh. And hark, as the visions grow dim to the sight, there comes Merry Christmas and Boy Day's good night. Hello everybody, my name is Tammy Gerson, and I'm here to read you a poem about the, the holiday of Hanukkah. Hello dear friends, both far and near, I bring you words of hope and cheer. Through the long dark days of gloom and sorrow, bright lights will glow and bring tomorrow. Hanukkah means to rededicate, each candle stands to educate. How Maccabees fought to reclaim their freedom and renew the sacred temple for that reason. And so we light one candle each night, eight candles shining so very bright. Oh Hanukkah, oh Hanukkah, we're glad you're here. Please bring us joy tonight and every night throughout the year. Thank you. Ice encrust your goggles, 25 below. Paths are sealed in darkness, Lord, there's no clear way to go. And winter trails dim well too fast, as eventide falls in tonight, with stars alone providing light. The world recedes as ways fall dark, and beauty drains from mortal sight a silent prison sealed in white. While woods so lovely, dark and deep, when viewed from lodge or well-groomed path, sometime in life will come a test when woods turn into wilderness, when dark and deep oppress the soul, when lovely turns to creeping cold. Your mind harks back to life before, spent safe beside the hearthstone fire, which burns in brightness even now, in warmth, the lodge at Lake Louise. You pause in awe of open sky, where holy visions crystallize, as early evening stars appear, with unseen wonders pressing near, beyond all words, but strange, clear, when set in stillness, white on white, so far from lodge at Lake Louise. But ice and crush your goggles, it seeps inside your soul, and time compresses tightly to frozen snowy hell, its icy heart indifferent 
the choices and we're told. So brave the cold, embrace the pain, then take a step and step again. Led by the arms of God to life, or to the arms of God to lie, matters not in wilderness. Resolve sustains beyond despair, if illness inner stillness shares the grace of snow-white peaks seen in the face, the placid depths of Lake Louise. Hey guys, my name is Jay and I'm going to be providing some haikus for the winter holiday season. Thanks again to the athens Clark County Library for hosting this event. I think it's a really great idea and a incredible way to stay connected during the times. So here are the haikus. Yuletide joy flutters through winter suspended light. Warm spirits shimmer. Masks cover faces, but can't contain our vast smiles. Fear gives way to hope. Southern snow is rare, an omen of coming change. Revelation melts. The family vigils send satellites into space, tender, loving eyes. Sheltering in place imbues the body safely. We await the spring. This has been so hard. I extend a hand to you in this together. Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening by Robert Frost. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near. Between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year, he gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. December. It's always been about some star, this welling joy and slant light days, encountering of longest nights with something kin to peace. Before the old relief, the cycles tip, our stars return to coax the seeds and warm the sap, to stir the sleeping ram to sow his crop of springtime lambs. And later, looking east, in the darkest night, we found the radiant point, the journey start to truth, once known, too evergreen to die, and love, too bright to dim. It's always been about some star, some cosmic, mythic, sacred star we hold, when days like these are pale being cold and slight, for in that star is hope. Good afternoon. This is a poem, a rendition of the famous poem, The Night Before Christmas, as might be uh, recited by one on a diet. Why anyone would want to be on a diet at Christmas escapes me, but nevertheless, here we go. Twas the night before Christmas and all round my hips were Fannie Mae candies that sneaked past my lips. Fudge brownies were stored in the freezer with care in hopes that my thighs would forget they were there. Hmm. While Mama and her girdle and I in chin straps had just settled down to sugar-borne naps, when out in the pantry they arose such a clatter, I sprang from my bed to see what was the matter. 
Away to the kitchen I flew like a flash, tore open the ice box, and then threw up the sash. The marshmallow look of the new fallen snow sent thoughts of binge to my body below. When what to my wondering eye should appear a marzipan Santa with eight chocolate reindeer. That huge, huge chunk of candy, so luscious and slick, I knew in a moment that I'd wind up sick. The sweet coated Santa, those sugar reindeer, I closed my eyes tightly, but still I could hear. On Pritzer, on Stillman, on Weak Ones, on Tops. A Weight, a weight Watcher dropout from Sugar Detox. From the top of the scales to the top of the hall, now dash away pounds, now dash away all. Dressed up in Lane, Brown, Lane Bryant from my head to night dress, my clothes were all bulging from too much excess. My droll little mouth, my round little belly, they shook when I laughed like a bowl full of jelly. I spoke not a word but went straight to my work and ate all the candy then turned with a jerk and laying a finger beside my heartburn gave a quick nod toward the bedroom I turned. I eased into bed to the heavens I cry and if temptations removed I'll get thin by and by. And I mumbled again as I turned for the light, for the night. In the morning I'll starve till I take that first bite. The dark shadow of space leans over us. We are mindful that the darkness of greed, exploitation, and hatred also lengthens its shadow over our small planet Earth. As our ancestors feared death and evil and all the dark powers of winter, we fear that the darkness of war, discrimination, and selfishness may doom us and our planet to an eternal winter. May we find hope in the lights we have kindled on this sacred night. Hope in one another and in all who form the webwork of peace and justice that spans the world. In the heart of every person on this earth burns the spark of luminous goodness. In no heart is there total darkness. May we who have celebrated this winter solstice by our lives and service, by our prayers and love, call forth from one another the light and the love that is hidden in every
ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas. Happy Holidays. Christmas show. Graceful dancing. Five golden rings. Spray painted hula hoops rattle. Weeks of Nutcracker rehearsals. Two performances, then months of earworms. Christmas kitchen. The turkey left alone. The dog feasts. Southern Nutcracker. Backstage whispered again and again. Excuse me. Country graveyard. On some plots, little Christmas trees. With dad at keyboard, the eight-year-old says yet again, it's my Christmas gift. After Christmas, bright and full, recycling bins. 3 a.m. reading in a hotel lobby. Thank God they've stopped the Christmas music. Curved on the winter field, that improbable purple blackberry canes. Brown weed coated in shining ice, Cinderella. Visit my parents before using the gift sh guest shower, remove bag of sprouting potatoes. Church play, the part of Jesus, preacher's kid. Church play, as the angel prepares to speak, he adjusts the volume. Rainy winter day, on tips of branches, water drops glisten. Styrofoam packing squiggles burst forth, first snowfall. The runoff pauses, icicles. Daughter in recital costume, reading with me, hops up on my shirt, gold sequin. Playing king in the ballet recital, the cloak makes me sweat. What's a regal way to scratch? Mountains, Near Mount Airy, a church advertises live nativity scene, drive through And winter sun, an old dog sleeps by the swing set. Thank you. May your holidays be happy and safe. First of all, thanks Van and ARLS for doing this project. When Van first asked me if I would like to contribute, my first thought was, I don't know if I really have a poem about winter and Christmas that's not about death or dying or some other equally depressing thing, which 2020 is kind of depressing enough. But then I discovered a poem I wrote a few years ago entitled The Spoils of Christmas. And it is mostly joyous with a tiny, tiny little dash of melancholy, which if you're a poet, one can't get too carried away with the joy. So here's my contribution, The Spoils of Christmas. The Spoils of Christmas. Burst of green and red lights scatter among brigades of boxes, tiny generals darting about, masters of reconnaissance, Fury they charge, dripping and tearing all resistance. Time becomes dizzy. It is over so quickly. The aftermath. Shrapnel, shredded paper and bows littered across the floor. A silence descends, juxtaposed against the assault's roar. And I tiptoe among the carnage. Wary of landmines, a tear stranded on my cheek. I'm careful no one else sees as they dance around the spoils of Christmas. Thank you.
It's December in Athens, but leaves are still falling and we're still in the midst of the pandemic. This poem is called Falling. A mosaic of autumn leaves, but part of me still also grieves. For another change of season, while some hold firm to selfish reason. Withholding care from those now least, maintaining power to fuel the beast, for bombastic, futile demands, as more retreat, empty commands. This poem is for the winter solstice. Ancient people of northern lands would ready for winter's demands of frigid cold and drifts of snow with wassail hot and mistletoe boughs ever green and carol song, with candles bright the evening long. From shortest days through longest night, a yule log burned till morning light. Christmas. We celebrate a time long past, the birth of Christ that was forecast. Conquered people prayed for relief. A coming king was their belief. A Messiah to set them free from foreign rule and tyranny. A soldier not, but simple boy who grew to teach God's love and joy. And finally, Christmas Day. Pine needles green, winter frost white, crisp morning air, clear starry night. Seasons old songs, young faces bright, red ribbon bows, soft candle light. Breakfast made hot, cocoa made sweet, wood fires warm, icy cold feet. People we love, near and apart, memory stir in every heart. Thank you. I'm Donna O'Kelly Butler. I'm the branch manager of the Bogart Library in the Athens Regional Library System. I wrote this poem, Winter Quilts, in memory of Ruby Gillespie O'Kelly, my mother. August 23rd, 1918 to December 18th, 2005. In December, the quilts return, stirring from summer sleep, drawn by gentle hands from shrouds of cotton used to shield fading colors from summer's bright sunlight. I free them from coffins of pine and cedar, tenderly unfold each naming pattern and maker to remind each quilt of its genesis. Sun Baby, my mother's first, soft in tones of gold and brown, the color of winter's fields. Look, see the determined stitches sewn by dimpled hands with tobacco sack thread beggared from her mountain granny, overseen by an exacting mother. Ruby, take those stitches out. You'll catch your toes in them. Trace, the sage green binding added in later years to hold the batting in. Sage green, the color of my mother's eyes. I clutch the quilt close and close my blue eyes. I breathe deep. Do I imagine the aroma of tobacco? from Granny's corn cob pipe. Autograph quilt, pieced by mother and friends, young wives and girlfriends at their first public jobs, seamstresses in a World War II uniform factory. Each brought a bright, cheerful square for the whole, basted together with laughter and tears while war raged abroad. 
Letters and news were scarce, but friendship plentiful remained. Sweet girls' names, embroidered, now faded, but never forgotten. Churn dash, each blue strip the color of a young husband's eyes. Exactly, precisely, exquisitely cut, pieced, and quilted by firelight and a single electric bulb. After a day in the factory, after morning and evening milking of cows, made in company with mother-in-law and sisters-in-law, all ears intent on the radio's news, all thoughts on four sons, seven brothers, one husband far away. There are so many more. Strip quilts sewn quickly to keep a growing family warm, hastily but lovingly made of pretty fabric, some strips torn from flower sacks, others hoarded from old dresses, once worn gaily to church and parties, scraps of another life sewn together to create life anew, that of mother and farmer challenged and busy. Each of these is lined with cotton, planted, pieced, and finished by the sower's own hands from her own field. Waste not, want not, coverlets of no particular pattern, sewn from a half yard here, a quarter yard there, extras left of clothes, handmade by a talented mother for her four daughters. Quilts, no. Quilted, yes, with batting of old blankets and bedspreads. One, my husband's particular favorite, made just for him to protect against an exceptionally frigid college apartment. It is pieced from scraps of polyester and flowered cotton, reminiscent of my teen wardrobe, worn with pride when first we met. It is lined with an old electric blanket. Flower garden and butterfly. These last creations, final proof to the maker that utility made by her hand was always beauty and art. These designed, cut, and sewn in wisdom, comfort, and contentment with self and life. Each block of both quilts exquisite, whimsical. On one each block a realistic embroidered favorite flower. On the other hand applique wings of yellows and lavenders, pinks, greens, and blues, remnants of maternity dresses, blankets made for the welcome of the last of the grandchildren, born of the youngest daughter and her husband. Now wakened at last, each quilt, cherished product of my mother's hands, waits to comfort and warm body and spirit. All old, all worn, all with soft batting, not of cotton, but of memories and dreams. Though treasured, not all will remain in my care. Each year, one or two are freed to warm the homes of my loved ones to warm the hearts of my loved ones. Two sons, one daughter-in-law, one grandson, all of whom have eyes of sage green. Christmas with my hyper-religious relatives by Bowen Craig. The season was upon us once more, oh, the merry we shall all make. Conifers tower over wrapped presents, semi-human shaped cookies to bake. This year I invited my entire brood to my humble place of dwelling, forgetting of one branch of my tree and the religion they're constantly selling. Uncle Pete and Aunt Rosie preached at us all holiday long, pausing only to breathe, hunting for sin under furniture, in books, anywhere that allows them to seethe. I had naively and completely forgotten how religious they always are, their habit of bringing Jesus everywhere, even the dashboard of their car. Determined both to humor these zealots and enjoy my yuletide in the traditional way, 
On December 23rd, I hatched my plan to keep jolly this Christmas day. To the liquor store I ventured, scooping up handfuls of airplane bottles in an attempt to keep my sanity through booze so as not to throttle. Uncle Pete, when he inevitably launched his standard faux Christian tirade against yoga pants, skinny jeans, fun, and anyone ever getting... It was destined to happen, as it did every single year. And dear lord, I can't stomach it with nary one drop of beer. So like a confused Easter bunny, on the 24th I did safely hide. Bottles all over the house, prepping for Christmas tide. Vodka in the dishwasher, bourbon under the sink. Spiced rum in the fridge crisper, in stolen moments I'll drink. At least two bottles per room, in anticipation of my brood. No matter where we did venture, I could refresh my mood. Vodka and OJ, rum and coke, popular historical mixes. The veil of useful family lies is the glue that always affixes. Our love to each other, for love's the actual point of holiday gatherings. Next year I may hide a... We lie to each other. We lie to ourselves. But lies, they're useful, like mall Santa's elves. When Rosie launched into her annual rundown of local sin, I reached under the couch cushion and rescued my Bombay gin. Uncle Pete recited his yearly wish for a new kind of chastity belt. I opened my freezer to check if the margaritas did melt. When Cousin Sharon agreed that Uncle Pete just might be right about rounding up Guatemalans and hiding them well out of sight, I took a deep breath and a hearty gulp of Jim Beam. Mixed with sparkling cider, calming down, it would seem. Twas nary one single fight in my home that holiday eve, because I had duct taped a jello shot up my left sleeve. Peace on earth was declared, at least in this house, this year. Sure, I threw up before dessert. Next year I may just stick to beer. I learned a valuable lesson Pete and Rosie never knew. The ultimate gift of delusion is powerful family togetherness glue. So Merry Christmas, Christians. Happy Hanukkah, Jews. Whatever you celebrate, it's better with booze. When cold moon lights the longest night, we're on the short side of the sun. These are the days of dusk. And the pale sun beats west through half-hearted arcs to warm the far-off southern sea. And Orion rises red-shouldered east into evening to hunt the blackened midnight sky. This is the season of silhouettes when dark forms cast shadows on the velvet void to illumine by absence a vast empty realm where love lies below layers, faith stands by frozen, and hope taunts the dormant heart. This is the grace of unknowing, the stage beyond belief and doubt, a place to bank the fire and wait. Till ice moon lights, late winter nights, we're on the short side of the sun. I drive a truck on a northern route. This happened one year when I was out, making the run from Portland up to Nome. One wrong turn led to another. I got lost, and I tell you, brother, I was cold as heck and wishing I was home. My CB was totally quiet, and it weren't the kind of good silent night. Shoot, I'd have been happy to see a bear. Then I turned the curve and saw a light. I'd found a house, a pretty sight. I thought I'd stop and ask directions there. Bundled up, I went to the door, knocked two times, and then two more. Finally, a female voice said, come on in. Now, going in was my first mistake, and seeing her caused a double take. That was a girl you might say was built for sin. She was sipping a beer and handed me one. Then she reached up and pulled her hair undone. I knew then it wasn't the beer making me warm. Now, ordinarily, I'm quite shy, but then again, I'm just a guy, and before I knew it, we were smooching up a storm. It was hot and heavy between her and me, then I looked up in time to see a fella heading for us and moving quick. 
He weren't too jolly. He looked right mad. I'd seen him before, or I thought I had, and I knew then in a moment that was St. Nick. And he said, Get your paws off of Mrs. Claus. That ho-ho-ho is mine. That jolly old elf couldn't stop himself. He was kicking my behind. He may look jolly in the cartoons, but that night he was mad as heck. He said, get your paws off of Mrs. Claus before I break your neck. So I said to Santa Claus, hear me out. I don't know what this is all about. I don't even know this woman here by name. Well, it's Cindy Lou, old Santa said. She's Cindy Claus. We're legally wed. Then he jumped on me till I thought he'd left me lame. He had a lot of fighting in for a little feller. His suit's all red, but he ain't yeller. He whooped my butt coming and going that day. About the time I thought that he was through, he grabbed me again and away I flew. But when I got loose that third time, I run away. And I heard him say, Get your paws off of Mrs. Claus, that ho 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 is mine. That jolly old elf couldn't stop himself, he was kicking my behind. He may look jolly in the cartoons, but that night he showed me what. He said, get your paws off of Mrs. Claus before I kick your butt. I ran outside, jumped in my truck, cranked her up, and I prayed for luck. Put the pedal to the metal right away. I saw the interstate sign after about a mile. I was back on track, and that made me smile, but I knew I would never, ever forget that day. Many years have now gone by since I met Santa and his lovely wife, but the scars of that encounter still remain. My new route is around Atlanta, cause ever since I met old Santa, the holidays remind me of all that pain. My advice to you, my friend, if a pretty lady invites you in, that's the time that you should really pause. And remember, Saint Nick is jealous plenty, and he'll whoop your butt if you touch Cindy, so keep your hands off of Mrs. Santa Claus. And he said, Get your paws off of Mrs. Claus, that ho-ho-ho is mine. That jolly old elf couldn't stop himself, he was kicking my behind. He may look jolly in the cartoons, but he whipped my butt just right. He said, keep your paws off of Mrs. Claus, Merry Christmas, and good night.